Okay, um, so hello everybody. Welcome, a good afternoon. My name is Isabel Hedrick. I'm a PhD student in the history department at the University of Texas at Austin. And I am delighted to introduce Dr. Sasha Goldstein Saba coming to us from The Hague in the Netherlands to talk about her research and her new book, which has just come out called Baghdadi Jewish Networks in the Age of Nationalism, published with Real Publishers. As um, you know, this talk is part of a fairly new lecture series called Jews in the World of Islam, which is a collaboration between the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies and Islamic Studies here at UT Austin. Last semester, for example, we brought in Paula Sanders from Rice University to discuss women and girlhood as depicted and decoded in the documents of the Cairo Geniza. We're really fortunate to have this lecture series here at UT because as many, but perhaps not all of you know, the field of Jewish studies has taken a significant turn in the last 20 to 30 years toward exploring the histories and experiences of Jews in Muslim majority lands, spanning from Morocco to Iran, and even as Sasha will discuss beyond to India and China. This expansion has had significant consequences and has reshaped not only the geographical boundaries, but the theoretical contours of the field. It has pushed us to think about Jews complicated relationships to European colonialism or colonialisms in the plural and the way that those colonialisms are practiced and enacted about questions of identity, inclusion, exclusion and citizenship about the uses of physical spaces in the Middle Eastern city and rural areas, and about Jews' relationships to nationalism and the modern state as it emerged. Obviously as well, this turn has had huge implications for the study of transnational and educational family and trade networks, which is what Dr. Goldstein Saba will be discussing with us today. Sasha Goldstein Saba earned her PhD from Leiden University in 2019. Her research focuses on the relationship between European and Middle Eastern and North African Jewry in the 19th century up until the creation of the State of Israel. It situates itself at the intersection of history, Jewish studies, and diaspora studies, and considers how disparate Jewish communities interacted with each other through philanthropic, business, and relig religious networks. Currently, she is working as a digital curator for the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam. And in addition to the book about which she will be speaking, which is literally hot off the press, she co-edited the volume Modernity, Minority, and the Public Sphere, Jews and Christians in the Middle East, also with Brill. So a couple uh, housekeeping details. Um, once we start the Q&A, if you could please use the raise hand function, not, not physically raise your hand, although you're welcome to do that too, but, but use the raise hand function in Zoom, which you can uh, access by going to the reactions at the bottom. Um, and that way we'll be able to see who's in the queue for, for the Q&A. And then also to please make sure that you are muted uh, during the talk itself. And other than that, please join me in welcoming Sasha to UT Austin. Thank you so much for having me. And before I share my PowerPoint, I want to try to gauge the room, um, the virtual room, as they will. Um, I'm not going to read a paper. I'm going to try to be interactive and engaging and not speak too quickly. So if you could just like use your emojis, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And if the answer is yes, just you can put the green yes or whatever you want. Who here? situates themselves more in Jewish studies. Okay. Who here situates themselves more in Middle Eastern studies? Okay. And who here is a student, graduate or undergraduate? Okay, cool. So at least now I can kind of gauge where, where we're at in terms of interest. Now I will share my screen and then I have to make it a presentation. Up. Okay. So I'm going to speak about the networks of Baghdadi Jews in the 20th century. But a lot of times I think 
a picture um, can kind of evoke an idea much better than, you know, talking for 10 minutes just about setting it up. So just look at this picture and really take the time to think about the young women you see in the picture. And I'll give you a little bit of information. These are Jewish schoolgirls at the Laura Kaduri School in Baghdad in 1928. And some of you might know a lot about Iraq in the 1920s. Many of you might not know anything about Iraq in the 1920s, but I really love this picture because I think it pushes how we think about the regular, you know, citizens or inhabitants of the Middle East and North Africa in this period, and even more so maybe how we think about Jewish women um, or Jewish young women. And you'll notice that, you know, the women in front are dressed relatively stylishly. They have bare shoulders. They're looking at the camera. Um, they've made food together, so they're eating together, and we don't know what it is. I think it's probably kibbe if you look really closely, but I always ask people to guess at the end if they have other ideas of what they're eating. Um, and there's a sign in the back, and the sign is not in Arabic, which you could think, right, because that's the language that's spoken in Iraq. Um, it's not in English either, which you could also think because there's a British mandate, right, this is part of the British Empire. Um, it's not in Hebrew, uh, which could also be the case. It's a Jewish school, although Hebrew wouldn't have been used that much. Um, it's in French. And it says entre scolaire, which means um, kind of like the idea of helping each other out within the school environment. So we have Iraqi girls in. Um, in a girls' school wearing very modern dress with a sign in the back in French. And the school is called the Laura Kaduri School. And Laura Kaduri was an English born woman, a Jewish woman, um, who married a man named Eli Kaduri, who was originally from Baghdad. They married in Shanghai. And when Laura was killed in a fire, Eli gave the money to build this school. Right? So I think this picture is kind of really the perfect example of these types of networks I'm talking about, right? And I should mention that this Laura Kaduri school is part of the network of schools called the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which some of you may have heard of, which I'll talk a little bit more about, which is based in Paris, which opens schools throughout the Middle East and North Africa in this period. So this picture really encapsulates all of these networks and how they come together. And even within Iraqi Jewish society, this is an organization where wealthier Jewish girls of greater means would also help poorer Jewish girls as well. So we see that this isn't even something classist, these networks, they really overlap. Um, and that's really kind of what my research is about. It's exploring how these Jewish networks existed in Iraq in this period and the influences they had on the Jewish community of Iraq and further abroad. Now, for those of you who have PhDs, for those of you who have, um, who are graduate students, right? You know that you never start from zero. Um, you always walk in the footsteps of giants. But you also need to kind of figure out what is innovative about your work. And for those of you who know a little bit about Iraqi Jewish history, this is not an underrepresented area of Jewish history or Middle Eastern history. Actually, a lot of wonderful work has been done on Iraqi Jews, particularly modern history of Iraqi Jews. And so these books are kind of just an example of some of the main publications. But they really fall into two categories. And one category, and that's the work of Ori Bashkin um, and Aline Schlafler, if you know either of these names, they're really important in the field. It looks at how Iraqi Jews in this period, so let's say the first half of the 20th century, really 
what Bashkin would call practiced Arab Jewishness. And what does that mean? Well, they engaged with Arab culture. They wrote in Arabic. The Arabic they spoke, although they spoke a communal dialect, also many people were very comfortable speaking what is referred to by linguists as Muslim Baghdadi. Um, they were part of the civil service. They felt Iraqi. Some of them described themselves as Arabs. And Orit Bashkin and Aline Shafler, they really looked at this and explained this process of how these Jews became part of the new Iraqi nation. And then you have other researchers whose work is just as interesting, um, Esther Meyer Glitzenstein in particular, and they look at the reaction of Iraqi Jews to Zionism, um, particularly in the 1940s and the political consequences of this. But the um, the ultimate conclusion is that Iraqi Jews are relatively apathetic towards Zionism, and I'm happy to answer questions about this at the end of my talk. Um, but these are really kind of the two main areas on Iraqi Jews. And so in the first year of my PhD, when I was looking at this question, my question became, well, okay, we know that they engaged with the Arab state, and we know that they had these reactions to Zionism, but what about everything in between, right? How was their Jewish identity expressed? Did they have a Jewish identity? What were the influences of the Jewish networks if they had any? And how did this work, right? Did they just situate themselves as Iraqis who were part of a religious community and they had no connection to other Jewish groups? Did they see it as a religion? Did they see it as something more um, we all know that terms like race and ethnicity are very problematic, although in their writings, they will use these terms. Um, and so that's really what my book and my research in general is about, and also kind of where I'm going with my next research project. So this is kind of like the nuanced research question on my work. So how did transnational Jewish interactions transform Iraqi Jewry and influence notions of Jewish identity, religiosity, solidarity, and belonging? But if we just wanna make it really simple, right? And try to get away from jargon, like what did being Jewish mean to them? If anything, right? It doesn't have to mean anything. Um, but I was really curious about this question and I was really curious about it because we know that there were, well, now I know a lot, um, but even when I started, there were vibrant Jewish communities of Baghdadis who lived in India, who lived in South Asia, who lived in London in the 1920s, in the 19th century. And the other thing which I'm thinking about more and more now as I think about Jewish networks um, is we have a tendency, which is incorrect, to think about migration, Jewish migration, as unidirectional, right? This idea that there is a tragedy or there is an opportunity and people will leave and they don't come back. And more and more, as we research Jewish history, we realize that this actually isn't what happens, that migration is unidirectional. And if migration, it, sorry, not unidirectional, but multidirectional. And if migration is multidirectional, well, what does that mean, obviously? because if you are a Jew um, from Baghdad and you live in India for five years or you live in London for five years, that will influence your worldview. And when you go back to Iraq, that will influence you. And I think anyone listening to my talk who's lived in another country or in another city, um, just for your studies, you know that these experiences change you. And so I was really curious about looking at this from the perspective of Jewish interactions um, in this period. And what's interesting about Jewish networks is that they really change in the modern period. If we look at Jewish networks prior to the 19th century, many times they're either they're organized around Jewish subgroups. So if you know the term Sephardi, Jews whose origins come from Spain, um, Baghdadi, Jews whose origins come from Baghdad, Maghrebi, North Africa, Ashkenazi, Eastern Europe, these groups have sophisticated networks, particularly Sephardi trade networks, but there's no idea of kind of one um, 
overarching Jewish identity. That's very, very difficult to pinpoint. We do see some examples and similarities and with these groups in this time, but it's very, very fluid. Um, and if you're interested in this, Matthias Lehmann has written about kind of these pre, these, well, let's say the early modern Jewish networks. Uh, so he's really the guy I would look at for them, but you do have Jews who send money to the Holy Land, to pious Jews who live in Jerusalem, who live in Sfat, for example. Um, and you do have Jewish communities who will ransom captives of other Jewish communities because that's seen as a mitzvah, right? That's seen as a commandment. But you're not necessarily going to have a Jewish community in London or France sending funds to Jews in Damascus or Baghdad or vice versa in the pre-modern world. We just don't have many examples of that outside of the spheres of, um, of uh, ransoming Jewish captives and Haluka. We don't have this idea of modern philanthropy, and that's not just a Jewish thing, of course. It's very much focused on charity, right? Ch helping the impoverished in your community. And a lot of what develops in the 19th century, of course, is this idea of philanthropy and helping communities and helping, in my context, Jewish communities. So very quickly, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on these slides, uh, so I don't want anyone to zoom out. What's interesting about Iraqi Jews is that they're really the original diaspora community and they're seen by Iraqi society as being indigenous, for lack of a better term, because you more or less have continuity in Jewish life in Iraq. So in the Iraqi context in the 19th, early 20th century, you have religious communities, you have Jews, you have different groups of Muslims, Sunni Shiites, you have different groups of Christians, Chaldeans, Assyrians. The Jews are one historic community. And in the 19th century, they remain a relatively impoverished community in a relative backwater of the Ottoman Empire. It takes over 30 days to get from Baghdad to Istanbul in uh, the 19th century, according to newspaper um, accounts of the voyage. But Baghdad begins to change. And Baghdad begins to change because of changes internal to the Ottoman Empire and also because of changes within the Jewish world. Um, so when we talk about the Ottoman Empire changes, we talk about the Tanzimat reforms in communal organization, modernization of infrastructure. And when we talk about Jewish changes, we talk about this rise of modern Jewish philanthropy, which I'm going to get to. But adjacent to this, you also have Jews in Iraq moving to India. And why are they moving to India? The British Empire and the opportunities it offers for trade. Remember Basra, which is in Southern Iraq, it's not a far boat ride to India. Jews traditionally multilingual in the Muslim world, very often cultural bridges between different groups. And so Jews, although you also have other religious groups. I mean, the Parsis are a great example as well. And you have Sunnis and Shiites who find themselves in India, but you have the beginnings of a formation of that Jewish diaspora, Baghdadi diaspora communities in India and later in uh, East Asia. And you have the founding of schools. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but I just, just Look at the picture below of the Sassoon family, very important family. And you can think about really the emergence of change in the 19th century, but change is slow. What's amazing is that we look at Iraqi Jewry in the 20th century, and the two pictures on the left are very different. Um, and in the first half of the 20th century, 25% of the population of Baghdad is Jewish, right? It's a Jewish city. And we're not talking about impoverished Jews anymore who necessarily need the help of Europe. We're talking about a vibrant community where the Jews are made full citizens in 1924, where although they get help in founding their schools by European Jewish organizations, by 1928, the schools are managed in Baghdad and decisions about curriculum are made in Baghdad. And the Jewish community of Baghdad represents perhaps the most important unified middle class within Iraqi society 
in this period of the 1920s and 1930s. And it will change and they'll become less important, not because their position declines, but because more Muslim Iraqis have access to education and have the possibility to ascend to the middle class. So the percentage of Jews in Baghdad will decline in the 30s and 40s, not because the Jewish population is declining, not because they're leaving, but because Iraq is thriving in many ways and therefore the overall population is growing. So what happens on the Jewish side, right? I kind of skimmed over the whole Tanzimat. Um, again, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Well, you have this idea of a, of a growing um, Jewish consciousness. And this happens through two events, the Damascus affair and the Mortara affair. Um, in both cases, and again, just for the sake of time and the desire to open this up to questions, I'm not gonna go into them in too, in too much detail, but these are two cases where, well, in the first case, Jews are accused of murdering a Capuchin monk in Damascus. And in the second case, um, a Jewish boy is secretly baptized by his nanny and taken away uh, from his family ultimately and never returned and raised by the church. And for Western European emancipated Jews, these two events reminded them that the rights they had acquired um, could very easily be taken away. And so we look at these as really tipping off points of the founding of modern Jewish philanthropy. And this idea that one way to fight anti-Semitism was by elevating Jews around the world and making them valuable members of society. And part and parcel of this, you have the emergence of a Jewish public sphere through an international Jewish press. And so events like the Damascus affair and the Mortara affair are discussed in this press as well. And so Jews know, what's, know, know what is going on in other Jewish communities. And it's really with the beginning in this period that some Baghdadi Jews, Jews in Baghdad, who have access to these newspapers originally through Jewish travelers, and then they travel themselves, very small numbers in the 19th century, um, they're aware of these things to the point where in 1860, 1864, a group of four Jewish men in Baghdad write to the Alliance, Israelite Universelle, and they ask them to help open a school. And that is the first school to teach secular subjects in Baghdad. It predates secular schools by the church, missionary schools, for example. It predates schools set up during the Tanzimat. So this is how we can see very early on how these networks already begin to change Jewish society. Of course, right now it's very top down. Um, it's very much controlled by European Jewry, the way the values are formulated, for example. Um, but this will change. And so we'll go from kind of this very Eurocentric vision of modern Jewish philanthropy Whereas in the 20th century with citizenship, with agency, with generations who are educated in secular schools and who travel, we can look at Jewish transnationalism and we'll see diverse groups of actors. So now Jews in Baghdad who travel for their work, who have family in India, in the Far East, even possibly in New York. We know that the Iraqis send a couple of boys to study at Yeshiva University. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, right? You have diverse actors and it's not just back and forth, it's all over the place. You also see that Iraqi Jews are very comfortable functioning within kind of an empire and working as builders of empire. They're comfortable being multilingual. Arabic remains their home language, but they see English as being very important uh, for business affairs, also for the relationship with the British, of course. We see the emergence of this national identity as Iraqi citizens coming with the rights of responsibilities. And we see interest in Zionism. And some people are more interested than others. Um, and that will change over the period of time, but it's an exciting time. And it's a time where Jews in Iraq very much feel that anything is possible. Why? Well, their socioeconomic profile as a community and for many individually is improving through access to secular education, through 
all of the economic opportunities that the British bring. Obviously, colonialism is something now we're constantly reevaluating, but certainly for the Jews in this period in Iraq, being part of this balance between the new Iraqi state and the role of the British Empire, they're really central. Why? Because they develop schools with multilingual curriculum decades before the other communities do this, to the point where elites from the other communities in the beginning will even send their children to the Jewish schools. What are the specific networks of the Iraqi Jews? Well, the satellite communities are very important. Again, why? India, up until the late 40s, British, right? The Jews in India, and also actually in East Asia, often take up foreign nationalities. They renounce their Iraqi citizenship, but they still very much identify with the Baghdadi community. And they see the Baghdadi community as being permanent, right? Sometimes you can refer to it as a little Jerusalem. And so when they invest in infra communal infrastructure, they will build the schools necessary in Shanghai, in Singapore, for example, but they will invest in the home community. And as a few of these families, such as the Sassoons and the Kaduris, but there are other wealthy families, the Ezra's, for example, the Gubis, um, they will act as an intermediary between these European philanthropic organizations on which they will sit on the boards and the Jewish communities. Right, And they will focus the agendas of these now international Jewish philanthropic organizations on Baghdad. And the organizations will provide expertise. They'll, for example, teacher training, curriculum support, um, but also doctors, nurses, right? Opening medical clinics and clinics which aren't only open to Jews, but are open to everybody. Um, they'll provide political support. So especially in the context of um, censorship, of complications with Zionism, right? And the influences that will have on the relationship with the Jewish community, the Iraqi state, there will be some back channeling of politics um, with diplomats and then financial aid, which really doesn't actually come from European Jewry. That really comes from the Baghdadis in the satellite communities and then local elites as well. Um, and you'll have religious networks. Um, the Jews, we can talk about modernity and secularity, but what modernity and secularity look like in the 1930s in Baghdad is very different than what we're talking about today. Jews would remain committed to keeping kosher homes, even if you might eat a kebab in the street and not tell your mother, um, as some of the memoirs will attest to, for example. Um, you will keep the holidays because that is part of your local culture, right? And so the rabbis will also engage with not only other rabbis in the Middle East and North Africa, but with rabbis in places like London and New York. And they will use their arguments against religious reform, citing these rabbis and getting their opinions. And of course, as well, because of the strong educational network in Baghdad, these Jews are also multilingual and they have access to a multilingual um, global Jewish media space. And in my book, I give a table, but we know that this, the libraries of the schools and certainly many individuals subscribe to over 20 Jewish newspapers, some published in the satellite community, some local, some from Europe, some from New York, some from other parts of the Middle East and North Africa. And they were published in multiple languages had periodicals in English, in Hebrew, in French, and in Arabic. So they're very, very much connected to global Jewry and new ideas about global Jewry and what this means in the 1920s and 30s in particular, all the while as they're becoming modern Arab Iraqis, right? And I think we have to remember that these two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, when we talk about how Jews in Iraq use these transnational uh, networks and kind of this Jewish public sphere in the press, you know, they will discuss religious reform, which is why the rabbis then need to get the rabbis from other communities to say, no, 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 that's gone too far. They will show their solidarity for German Jewry after 1933. 
they will make appeals to public opinion and other Jewish communities to help them in moments of difficulty. And they will become engaged with these newspapers and articles that individuals in Iraq will write will also be syndicated in the Jewish Telegraph Association. So other Jewish communities will know about what's going on with their community. Um, so when we think about Iraqi Jews in this period, we need to look at it as nuance, right? We're not just talking about, you know, Jews who see themselves 100% as Arab or 100% as Jewish or Zionist or anti-Zionist. Um, Jews, many of them adopt a national sentiment towards the Iraqi state, but not all. And when we talk about differences, it can be in the same family. And wherever you come from, I mean, I guess because I'm speaking to mostly Americans here, I mean, think about Thanksgiving. Um, and think about all of the political opinions or worldviews within your own family, right? It's really the same in Iraq in this period. And what's interesting is if you look at the elites in the community, they're present on a communal level as community leaders, on a national level as elected officials, as important members of the civil service, and, as a, and on a transnational level in these Jewish communities, in these Jewish, I'm sorry, in these Jewish organizations. Um, and because the Jewish community enjoys so much socioeconomic mobility in the 1920s and 30s in Iraq, of course, they see Iraq as being worthwhile to invest in, to invest in a Jewish infrastructure, right? How can you imagine that the first diaspora community would dissolve so quickly? Um, they are comfortable in multiple cultures and they actively participate in these transnational networks. And the majority are not interested in Zionism, which is understandable, right? Because life in Iraq is good. So why would you want to go to Palestine where you're very aware of the current tensions and struggles? So some conclusions. Um, there's a symbiosis in this period between the communal, the national, the transnational, right? This is not, there's no conflict in this period between being a Jew, seeing oneself as an Arab. And oftentimes these transnational connections benefit larger Iraqi society, right? Building schools, building hospitals, training generations of engineers, of teachers, of doctors, right? The Jews are seen as a model population and that very much ties on the initial ideas of Jewish internationalism in the 19th century. Similarly, from the perspective of European Jewry and the perspective of colonialism, these links are prestigious for British and French Jewry in similar ways and later American Jewry, I think we can argue. Um, but these multiple networks should never be seen as exclusive and most elites who participate in these networks um, are engaged in multiple networks. But we shouldn't think that these, this is only the elites, right? Transnational networks also influence all demographics of Middle Eastern and North African Jewry as a whole. And I think that's important to think about. And so that's why you need to go back to that picture of the girls, right? Because that's an organization where wealthier girls are showing solidarity and doing things with poorer girls, right? So the poorer girls are very aware of the role of these philanthropies. People are very aware that if their children are educated in schools, this money is not just coming from Iraq, it's coming from the satellite communities and the curriculum is coming from from Europe or influence from Europe. And there are Jewish teachers coming from other communities in the Middle East and North Africa. And that this is changing social norms throughout, right? Um, so then just kind of some final thoughts and then we'll still have plenty of time for questions. Um, the transnational Jewish internationalism that we think about in the 19th century, which is very top down and Eurocentric it really morphs into something which is much more bilateral in the early 20th century. And I think that by studying the reactions and values and interests of the Jews who come from the Middle East and North Africa can teach us a lot about the worldview of Jews in the early 20th century, although this power of differentials certainly remains. Also, I haven't spoken about it, but I think something which is super interesting and this is more for the Jewish studies people probably, is that um, we talk about Jewish national divisions today, right? And Mizrahim and how they were treated when they arrived in Israel. But in this period, 
there's so much travel and so much exchange amongst Jews within the Middle East and North Africa. Can we talk about new forms of Jewish identity that we're developing, which were regional or language based, but not necessarily related to shared religious customs. Um, and then kind of one final thing to think about, the creation of the state of Israel post 1948, changes the historic narrative um, of Jews in the Middle East and North Africa and their relationship to Ashkenazim. And I think we need to begin to rethink that. I think we need to think about it as regionality, as the relationship with Eastern Europeans, the relationship with how um, their experience with expulsion with their arrival in Israel. But if we look at these exchanges through these transnational networks, um, they weren't always perfect. There were certainly lots of racism, but they were fruitful and especially over time really became built on mutual respect and mutual exchange. And I think that kind of changes how we think about these networks in the early 20th century in particular. So that was my talk. Um, thank you for listening. And I'm happy to answer any and all questions you may have. Okay, um, so I see Jonathan Kaplan has a question. Yes, th thank you, Dr. Goldstein Saba. Uh, very stimulating topic uh, and very stimulating talk and, and very thankful for you sharing your research here with us. I had a question if you could elaborate a little more. You, you referenced this a bit in your discussion of uh, families like the Kaduris and the Sassons and, and things like this who are still very prominent families, uh, so, so much so that in, in my field, the the leading scholar, James Kugel, when he decided finally to fully commit to Israel, goes by the name Yaakov Kaduri back in, back in Eretz Israel, as opposed to, uh, which leads to some confusion. That's um, interesting. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because he, yeah. Because he's Iraqi. He's, he's, yeah, yeah, he's, he's Iraqi. Iraqi. Yeah, yeah. Although he has his Ashkenazi name for outside the land, his, his, his yeah, Zionist yeah. name is really an Iraqi name. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm placing it actually now. Yeah. Speak. Yeah. So, so it, it, it uh, in any case, I mean, he, he that that you mentioned some of these families as being large family groups, and I, I wonder, you know, you talk about regional identities, but I, I wonder if the beginnings of the formation of regional identities, uh, how do those map on to socioeconomic and class distinctions within the Jewish community? Um, I, I think particularly the Moroccan Jewish community, which is even to this day one thinks of sort of monolithically, but it, it's actually very variegated mm -hmm. both on. Uh, socioeconomic levels, and then based on whether which part of the country you're from. Yeah, north, south. North, yeah. south, but also are you Berber in your descent, yeah. these types of things. So how does that play into the discussion of these networks? So are they really just the effort of still kind of even a top down within internal to Iraqi Jewish society, mm -hmm. or something that's much more variegated and, and cross cutting across the, the very socioeconomic distinctions? So um, a couple of points. I think you bring up some really good points. Uh, in the Iraqis, well, the Iraqis really see themselves as one community minus the Neo-Aramaic speaking Jews in the North, right? And they're seen as the <clears throat> hillbillies. And when they migrate to Baghdad, right? Again, you know, this migration from rural to urban, for example, they are the maids they are the drivers of these families. And interestingly enough, as members of, um, we call them Kurdish Jews, although that's not really the right term, as they begin to um, ascend, they begin to call themselves Iraqi, right? Or Baghdadi, right? So they take on this Baghdadi identity. Um, even there's a book called Shlomo al-Kurdi. It's translated from Arabic into French. I don't think there's an English translation. Like they talk about this, um, but there is a Baghdadi identity. And the Baghdadi identity, as I would see it, is very much based on building a certain type of classist identity, but even the poorest Baghdadis will take on this identity. And particularly in, I'm sorry about these messages, it's a bug in my very old laptop. Um, they, will, they will use this identity to distinguish themselves, frankly, from the poor Ashkenazim, in uh, India and Southeast Asia from the indigenous Jewish groups in India, but they will use this identity in a classist way um, to say we are educated, we are Iraqi. They'll try to even in times draw a link to Spain 
to show that they're actually European. So they use that. So that's kind of one framing of it. And you'll see Aleppan Jews who also in India will use uh, the term from Baghdadi in a similar way. But interestingly, at the same time, if we look at middle classes, oh, this, I'm really sorry about the beeping. Um, the, the- um, We can't hear it, Sasha. Oh, you can't hear it? Well, that's, that's good. I'm I, glad. I, I can't that, that or, see, that, or see anything. Yes, excellent. Um, the, the, they, right? So you have lots of Iraqis who will work in, in Cairo and Alexandria in the 1920s, and they'll marry with Egyptians. And you'll have Moroccans who will also go to Cairo in this period and Alexandria for similar economic reasons. And so I think when I talk about kind of this like pan Middle Eastern identity, which is very different ideologically from the modern Mizrahi identity, that's where we really see that forming. Um, so those are kind of two different identities which overlap on each other. And I think, you know, you brought up Morocco, which is really interesting because, of course, people identify themselves often in relation to how, who they're speaking with, right? And in what, in what context. So in one context, you might say, I am a Moroccan Jew. But in another context, you would say, well, I'm Meknesi, right? Because that person has a context of what Meknes is in comparison to being from Marrakesh or from Tangier. In the Iraqi context, you will also have nuances like that. But I think what's interesting is that if you look at the, the Kaduris, for example, and the Sassoons and these big families, they maintain this Baghdadi identity. And certainly in the satellite communities and in Iraq, it's very much seen as something which is prestigious as well, right? Um, but even the lower classes will also assume this identity, of course. And, you know, migration into India as well, it's a bit control, a Jewish migration with, I mean, we're talking about small numbers here, to be honest. Um, it's very much controlled, but the, the Iraqis, the Baghdadis in India will recruit educated Baghdadis um, from Iraq to go to work in their factories. And they're very much controlling this because they want the good immigrants. They want to externally show a good, um, a good communal vision. And so, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's always based on this outside world and considerations of not being seen as indigenous in a colonial context outside of Iraq, for example, being seen as European. So kind of answers the question. Um, Marcella? I think that Tatiana, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I think Tatiana was here before me raising oh. her hand, so you're oh. muted, Tatiana. Tatiana, you're muted. Oh. I was going to tell Marcella she could just go ahead, but since I now unmuted myself. Oh. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Um, so actually, and I apologize for that, my question goes a little bit beyond the time period that you spoke yeah, about. Yeah, sure. And um, so I'm, after 1948, um, mm -hmm. when there is this kind of dispersion, do, mm -hmm. do the people leave, who leave Baghdad kind of funnel out into the satellite communities or do they go to the, the you know, the imperial centers, if you will, right? Yes. Um, and is that also class-based? So um, it's, yeah, so it's class-based, but the majority go to Israel. And why did they go to Israel? Well, that's really the only place they can go. So we have to think about the world in 1948. Very difficult to get into Britain, India, right? Decolonization as well, lots of insecurity. Singapore, these are the main, Shh, Singapore, also very uncertain situation after World War II, Shanghai, um, commun communism, these are not places you can go. So most of the Iraqis go to Israel. And it's interesting because I used to say any Iraqi or Baghdadi, we can use the term interchangeably in this case, who could go to London or Australia or New York would go there and wouldn't want to go to Israel. But in the end, that's not the case. When I was looking through the archives, I saw some elites had opportunities um, to go to France, for example. But remember, France in 1948 after World War II is not the easiest place to be either. And they decided to go to Israel. And why did they decide to go to Israel? And this is really from their writing. 
because they say that's where my community is rebuilding itself. And that's where I'll find the same people. Um, and so it's not perfect. And these are people who are really aware of the problems in the new state, right? Who see this with eyes wide open um, and they make this decision. So the answer is when the community dissolves, most people go to Israel. Some people who can join family in other places will join them in London in particular. Some people, again, New York, Australia a little bit. Um, you also will have people who go to India for a bit and then go to Israel. Um, but, but, I, but this is, and this is very much as well, um, a function of just what the world looks like in 1948. I think sometimes we have such a tunnel vision that we're just thinking about the creation of the state of Israel that we forget um, what the rest of the world looks like and it's still really in shambles after World War II. Yeah. So Marcella? Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon from Italy, I would say, so hello. Um, I very much enjoyed this talk and uh, so thank you very much. I have a couple of questions concerning the sources for mm -hmm. your work and the languages mm -hmm. um, that are needed given that you stressed more than once the multilingual yeah, sure. situation of, this, uh, of these communities. But rather than asking you which sources you used, which I would never do, but I will of course read the book, I'm actually more interested in understanding how you can emerge, how you, ma you can make emerge the voices of the lower classes through the sources that you used. Um, and I'm referring to this, I'm thinking about in particular those Baghdadi Jews that uh, moved to India, to China, to Singapore, to Burma, Myanmar mm -hmm. at the time, to work for the wealthier families mm -hmm. like that. So how can you make their voices okay. um, emerge? And, and that's my first question. And then I have another question which is connected to what you just mentioned, the emergence of um, um, a sort of a proto-Mizrahi, you said, regional mm -hmm. identity, but then you mentioned the emergence of uh, Spain and Sfarad, the myth of yeah. Sfarad um, coming out in the 1930s. And I was interested in um, asking you, how is that connected to the um, I, to two things? First of all, the rise of anti-Semitism in Iraq and the decline of this very glorious community for various reasons, but also the various programs of the Spanish governments in the, in, of the 1930, 31 and 32 to give citizenship to mm -hmm. Jews who would prove um, Sephardi descent in 1949. Okay. So if that is discussed. Thank you so very first, much. Sure. So first, the question about the sources. Um, Obviously, I used a lot of historic newspapers um, and I tried to track, for example, syndication. So if you could track syndication in English, French, Hebrew, and Arabic um, through the JTA. So you'll have Al-Alam al, -Al which is from Lebanon, and they will syndicate pieces in Arabic, which are written in French and which are right. Um, and then looking at the publications also of the satellite communities, which are primarily in English, and then the historic Arabic language newspapers, of course, of Baghdad. Um, but again, Orit Bashkin and Aline Shakler have worked a lot on that. So I looked a lot at the, the newspapers of the satellite communities, which I think you've also looked into in your own research. Um, in parallel to that, I used the archives of the Kaduri family. Um, and so those are in Hong Kong. They're not digitized. And they are in, there's really no Hebrew there, but there's English, French, and, and Arabic, right? Um, and they're their communications. Same thing with the Sassoon archives in Jerusalem. And, um, and then if you use the Iraqi Jewish archives, um, which are online, if you know about these, they have a lot of the communal archival notes. So my Arabic should be much better than it is, but certainly if it's a printed letter, right? I can, that's, that's okay. Um, and so what's really interesting is you can see in those archives, but they're very difficult to access. You can see the, um, you can see the school budgets, for example, right? You can see the, the amount of money that goes to help underprivileged um, Jews and the issues going on in this. So kind of from different aspects, but what's really interesting when you talk about finding the voices of poor Jews, like that's always a challenge. Um, but the lines between extremely wealthy and dirt poor are quite short. 
And so one of the things I found in both the Sassoon archives and the Kadori archives are petitions for money to their wealthy cousins. Um, and when the family members are, the wealthy family members are talking between themselves, they also have discussions about who they're going to help and why they're going to help them. And then even in the central Zionist archives, and I think the, these, I think most of this discussion is in Hebrew. Um, and again, I'm not an amazing linguist, but I have lots of nice friends who help me out when I don't understand something, to be very clear. Um, they, they talk about not wanting poor Jews in India who, who aren't educated and shipping them to Palestine in the 1930s to work in the fields. So all of this to say, um, you, I, I guess the voices you really hear from the petitions and also occasionally when poor students who have benefited through the schools write letters or write in newspapers, like that's where you hear those voices because there's so much upward mobility. And then I spent a lot of time reading reports on communal charity and the challenges. And so, so that's kind of there. So that was one question. As for getting um, Spanish citizenship, the answer is I haven't come across any of that. Um, and I talk about kind of this idea of being Sephardic in my book a, a bit, but Macy Meyer, and I think you, you know her work, like she really talks about this Sephardic identity as well. And so, I mean, what my work is, I mean, I really just agree with what Macy says and integrate it into my own work as well. Did I answer everything? I feel like I might be forgetting. Okay, cool. Um, so, Hina? Yeah, hi. Oh. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, and <clears throat> this is totally the uh, the outsider question. Uh, so since we're running out of time, and if uh, you, you may decide to just refer me. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm I, you know, coming from working on European Jews in Iran, uh, I, I'm sort of, I'm of course thinking about the influx of Baghdadi Jews, uh, particularly into uh, into Iran, into Tehran in the 1930s, and the you know enormous impact they had on the Jewish community, also in terms of wealth and uh, professionals, and uh, and so I'm I just you know you, you, I, I'm sort of I'm missing the transitional moment. I mean we know about. 1948, but in a sense, I mean, sort of, you're describing this extremely successful community uh, in the 1920s, uh, and clearly, I mean, we know that something went very wrong in the 1930s, uh, and so I, I just was hoping that you could maybe say a few words about, you know, sort of that transition, which is different so from 1948. I would, I would say very quickly, it's not like there is one transition, right? Like it's a very slow process of, of things changing. And it's, it's based on changes in the Arab world. It's based on World War II. It's based on decolonization. It's based uh, on Palestine. So it's not overnight. And I think what's shocking in, in 48 is actually how quick it is because no one, no one expects that. But even when there are issues in the 30s, I mean, no one everybody just thinks that they're hiccups, right? And things will sort themselves out. So, so there isn't one moment. And the ascension of this Jewish community is also, it's not one moment. That's why I start with the school in 1864. Like it's slow and it's progressive. And that's also kind of why it's so successful. So that's, that's kind of what I can say about that. It's not, uh, Hina? Thank you so much for your talk, Sasha. I learned a lot. This is all like mostly entirely new for me. Um, so I was just taking notes and hanging on by the seat of my pants. Um, I, can you, I'm interested in knowing, um, just as somebody who does Islamic studies, um, can you tell us a little bit about, if, if, if you can, um, about sort of what the relationships look like between this the Iraqi Jewish community and it's sort of the larger or wider sort of Muslim majority okay. and it, were there <clears throat> like in these um in these networks whether within Baghdad within Iraq within the Middle East Mina or yeah. you know, 
but was there any sort of intertwining at the, at the philanthropic level or you know yeah, that's a really good question um so first of all i'd really invite you to read the work over Reed bashkin because she talks about this a lot but there when we think first of all about like baghdad in the 20s 30s 40s even it's less about Jew and Muslim, and it's more about religious communities. So actually, for a period of time, the Jewish community represents a plurality in Baghdad, because then Muslims kind of divide themselves between Sunni and Shiite, and right? So it's, so, and then the Christians break up into their own groups. But, you know, it changes over time, but you have Muslims in Jewish schools, you have Jews who go to state schools, you have people who study in university together. They go to the same social clubs, particularly men in coffee shops. I would say women overall have less interaction with non-Jewish women, but certainly men. And, and also they're ascending to the civil service, right? And so they're working in offices with, with Christians and Muslims and people from all of these communities. And what's interesting, and the, the only place I've really seen this, but I'm sure it happens elsewhere, is that the Baghdadi Jews in Singapore are very close with other Arabic speaking Muslim groups in, um, in Singapore, for example. Um, and you know they're working together to import food. The, the Jews run a pretty strong business in importing dates for Ramadan. Uh, so there's, there, there is this very close connection because there's a cultural connection, there's a linguistic connection. Um, and I think what's so painful for Iraqis, um, and this is really seen in, in all of the, the memoirs that come out from primarily men um, who grew up in Iraq in the 30s and 40s, is that when they leave, when the community basically dissolves, all of these friendships are, are torn apart. And that's really traumatic. It's very interesting, um, especially the, the, the gender angle is kind of, and, and also um, that there were um, Arab Muslims who were going to the Jewish schools, which kind of piqued my interest. So. Until, until, the, Jew, until the, the Muslim schools attain the same level, um, it's actually preferred in many cases to send your kid to a Jewish school because they won't proselytize compared to the missionary schools. Uh, okay. so, so you do have it, but then by the 30s, it's very uncommon, but certainly in the 20s, and you hear people say, you know, I met, um, I met Abdul in, in school when he was at the Alion school, and that, you know, that also gives the Muslim students and the Christian students a different view of Judaism, of course, as well. Very interesting. Thank can you. I, can I just jump in and say that, um, Hina, if this is something that's interesting to you, there, there is sort of a core group of Iraqi Jewish writers who, who came to Israel and were writing in Arabic for a while and eventually all of them except one <laughs> um, started, they abandoned the Arabic and of course the one who kept writing in Arabic, nobody ever read him, which was really unfortunate. Um, but the rest of them were writing in Hebrew and many have been, you know, become very popular and been translated into English. And there are some of them who write pretty extensively about you know, growing up in Iraq and being in Iraq fiction, right? Um, and, and a lot of it speaks to, to some of the questions that you just posed, and I'll be happy to talk to you about that. Wow, yeah, it sounds great. I, in, I, I, for the book version, because it's like a very revised version of my dissertation, I did cut down the literature summary, but if, if your library gets the book, like all of these bibliographies, they're all mentioned in there as well. Um, and there's like a whole discussion of them because they're really important and they're a really interesting window into the world. And I kind of juxtapose actually that and like this youthful memory of, of um, Iraq with a private um, archive of a man who was, you know, in his 30s and 40s during the 30s and 40s and his view, which is very different, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a, a, a push for reading my book, of course. Shameful, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any, any other questions? The students can ask questions too. Oh, I just read Victoria by Sami Michel and have it, yeah. I'm willing to return it. <laughs> yeah, it's somewhere on my book. I'm still, I still have to, if you read French, this book is really good too. It's the translation of Samir Nakash, right? Um, into French, 
um, of his uh, Shlomo, Shlomo Le Kurd, or Shlomo Al Kurdi. We actually that. have we have a pretty big archive of his documents at the UT oh, library. Cool. Our, our librarian here had some contact and one of our um, PhD students who's now graduated were in touch with his widow and managed to get a treasure trove of materials, all in Arabic, of course. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Is that? So, yeah. Um, let me lower my hand now. Yeah, so, uh, and I wanted to say super quick to address Hina's question. Um, the Alliance Israelite also made it, they, they actually wanted to recruit Muslim students. Like to them, it enhanced mm -hmm. their prestige to have especially the children of Muslim elites in their schools. So this was very common in Iran and, and, and it was their policy from the very beginning to attract non-Jewish students as well as Jewish students. Um, so, so in, in that context, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not as, as surprising. This was very much part of their sort of philosophy, but it also made them look good and, and all of that. Um, but my question for Sasha is um, with the Alliance, first of all, just basic question of like, how long was it in Iraq? When did it leave Iraq? Cause I know they left for a while after World War I, but I'm assuming they came back. Mm -hmm. um, and then also why, um, given that Iraq was so much more heavily British influenced and part of this sort of British, both mm -hmm. empire and soft empire, um, why would people be interested in sending their kids to a French school? Okay, so I will give you like the very short answer, but I will say there's a good, I don't know, 20 pages on my book that discuss this whole thing. Alliance comes into Iraq very early, 1864, and they stay, but their importance certainly diminishes um, after World War I, right? And why does it diminish after World War I? Well, the British are there and English becomes more important. However, they develop this framework and actually after World War I, you don't have that many schools which are officially Alliance schools. You have Laura Kuduri, you have Albert Sasson, and then you have a couple of other smaller smaller schools. But even in those schools, um, you have more Arabic education. First, because the Jewish community says, our children need to speak Arabic. Um, and then because later the government will mandate it as well. Uh, so it's like a modified Alliance curriculum. But also, and this gets back to this gender thing, why do you learn foreign languages, right? Is it pragmatism? Is it prestige? And so for boys, it's very important to speak English and, um, and Arabic, of course. But for girls, French is really seen as the, educate, the language for educated girls for making good matches. Um, and this is, this is discussed. I, Esther Meyer discusses it in her book. I discuss it as well of course, um, and we see it in the school notes and the discussions about educational policy. Um, and what I found really interesting is there's definitely an ascension in the importance of the Anglo-Jewish Association, which is different from other places. Again, it has to do with the role of the British in Iraq um, and even, well, of the British in Iraq, uh, but the Alliance and the Anglo-Jewish, like they collaborate. So they're also polite to each other and so the Alliance stays involved and they help find teachers, but they're certainly less important, although they remain active up into 48, um, than, than the British influence of the Anglo-Jewish. And then the Americans also um, are involved as well. And that, yeah, so World War I, World War II, I mean, when Paris breaks down, the central Alliance does not function. But actually, because the Kaduris are financing a lot of the Alion schools in Iran, in Damascus, in Lebanon, right, and in, <clears throat> in Iraq as well, even the, it's, it's kind of the regional hub. And this guy, Ibrahim Nahum, who I write a lot about, he's managing these schools. And so it, it, it's, just, it's just slow. And it's again, it's like this slow, it's this slow evolution. It's not like there's ever one breaking point, well, except um when the 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 community takes back its organization of communal education that's kind of the one breaking point and that's that's really when there's a distancing from the alliance but it's done in a very tactful manner um 
and I say this because I I read the I read the the um, the archive discussions about this and it's, you know, the British are really don't want to ruffle any feathers and they go to Paris and they have tea with with the heads of the alliance and they, they sort out how they're going to organize. Also remember like they're swapping things around because um, the alliance takes over Morocco and they take over Iraq more or less. So like in Mogador you have the Anglo-Jewish who was active prior to World War One and they kind of pass more of that off to um, the Alliance and I don't know, like Daniel Schrader writes about this and like Stella Corcos and you can read about that, so. Um, it's 710, I don't know if we have to give up the, the Zoom spot, but. Um, we I don't, you um, does anybody have any uh, last questions? I'm thinking. Um, well, it, otherwise, I, I think now's a great time to wrap up, Sasha, unless you had anything else you wanted to add. But um, thank you so much for coming. This was really wonderful. And it, it's very exciting to bring you here. And hopefully we can bring you here in person one of these days. Yeah. And, and um, there's, there's a real book now. It's, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Congratulations on That's the book. Great. It's great. I will get UT libraries to yeah. buy it. Yeah. I have a discount code I can email to anyone if they want their library to buy it. Yeah. I don't know, but libraries have budget for this stuff. Yeah, just send me, like if you Google my name, you can find my email address. Yeah. I'm happy to send you the flyer with the discount code. Right, and um, and thanks so much for contributing to this, this discussion and to our speaker series um, and helping to sort of enlarge our understandings of all of these really interesting topics. So um, if everybody can give another round of applause to Sasha and- um, My you know. pleasure. Thank you so much for thanks. attending. All right. And thanks to our yeah. audience for coming as well. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.